Well, the next person I'm going to ask to come up on the stage doesn't, re stage doesn't really need an introduction. Pastor Barry Jones has been with us for many years and is going to be bringing the message today. He was a, a pastor uh, of Cascades Baptist for several years and then um, went into missions. Uh, he is beloved by all who have uh, been here, uh, some as long as he has, and uh, we are excited to hear what God has put on his heart today. So, uh, Pastor Barry, would you come up and share with us, please? <laughs> Thanks, God. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wake up, man. Um, I had a little, uh, little excitement here about uh, 10 minutes ago. Uh, this morning I was uh, sharing with my son Shannon, who uh, lives in Georgia, came up for the weekend. And uh, I was sharing with him that I normally don't use uh, uh, notes in my preaching because uh, I usually preach from a text, from a passage, and any notes I need I can usually fit on the page of my Bible. And, uh, and I've got normally a pretty good memory, but obviously I didn't have a good one this morning because those three by five cards uh, are now on my dining room table. <laughs> So uh, I just spent, uh, you know, uh, the song service trying to recreate them. And uh, this isn't the first time this has happened to me. I remember years ago doing a wedding here. It was uh, one of the Hooli girls. And, uh, and I remember getting up here and uh, getting all ready and the bride's coming down the aisle and then it hits me, I don't have my notes. And, uh, and it's not that the notes were really important as for, the, for the most part, but the vowels were written down. <laughs> And so I, I'm thinking to myself, I could have everybody, I could just tell everybody to chill out and I could run back to my office and get that, uh, the sheet of vowels and uh, come back out here, or I can wing it. So I decided in my great wisdom to wing it. And so uh, uh, the service was going along fine. And, uh, and during, like, so there was special music and other things going on, it gave me a little time to think, okay, Jones, what are you going to do? And so I uh, finally came to the conclusion that when it came to the vows, I was just going to make up my own. <laughs> And, uh, and I just had to be consistent, you know, the vows for, for him and the vows for her, they needed to be similar, okay? And so I made my way through it, and after the wedding was over, people were coming up to me and said, Pastor, those were the greatest vows. <laughs> You know, the greatest vows, we, they were so refreshing, so different, so, so new. And the amazing thing, Pastor, is that you had them all memorized. And uh, they didn't realize I was just making them up as I, uh, as I went along. So. so anyways, I think that's, uh, Shannon said, told me, he says, this is the Lord's way of making sure you're relying upon the Spirit of God this morning instead of uh, your, uh, your notes. My message this morning is uh, entitled Walking with Jesus, but if I gave it a whole title, it would be Walking with Jesus uh, in Pain and Suffering. Uh, suffering, to me, is like the elephant in the room. You know, we use that phrase, the elephant in the room, to, to talk about uh, uh, big things that are obvious, but nobody talks about them. And, uh, and suffering is, um, it's, it's everywhere. Okay, if you were to look around the room, you're looking at people that are going through hard times. You're looking at people who, who have uh, just been through difficult times, who are going through hard times, or they're about to enter into some really difficult times. And so, uh, suffering is something that um, we all are going to experience. Uh, I don't want to try to come across like I'm some uh, expert on suffering, but I guess I've been there. I am there, okay? 
most of you know uh, our, our situation. Uh, uh, about 10 years ago, Linda started struggling with some of her uh, brain functions. And um, five years ago, and we were on the mission field, and, and we were, you know, doing okay. We were always together, and that helped her function. And, uh, and, I, and we were always, uh, I was always there to help her and to, you know, kind of uh, help her get through situations. But about five years ago, it just became obvious that we couldn't do that anymore. And uh, it just became obvious. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to lose her in some big airport in India. And, uh, and uh, you know, we just can't do this anymore. So we retired from our missionary ministry, uh, came home and functioned for a couple of more years at home. And then three years ago, uh, it became obvious to the children and myself that uh, we needed to place Linda in a memory care facility. Um, now, many of you have had loved ones who have had memory issues, but Linda's dementia is quite, quite unique. I see a lot of people almost every day who are struggling with memory care issues, and, uh, but Linda's is quite different in that uh, Linda's brain difficulties uh, has brought her to the point where she cannot communicate and she cannot walk and she's incontinent. And, and I can go right down the line. Every, everything that talks about a chronic illness, she has it. She has it. The last couple of weeks, uh, she has declined another step, and uh, she's uh, now entering the phase where she's uh, uh, where she doesn't want to eat. She's still taking liquids, but she's uh, refusing to take food. And um, so, anyways, uh, and, and many of you have been through. Uh, I won't say similar things, but but difficult things. You know, we could talk about, uh, you know, I can, you know I, I, I'm not going to do this, but if I asked everybody who has uh, either been through cancer or a loved one, a close loved one through cancer, I think the hands would be everywhere. I, uh, I did bring uh, some of my library with me this morning. I think I've read every book that they've uh, come up with lately on, uh, on, on pain and suffering. And I, I just wanted to bring these in and, uh, and thinking, and I'm going to give Sherry a list of these, and maybe she'll put them in the bulletin or on the website. Uh, uh, a Shelter in the Time of Storm by Paul David Tripp. It's on Psalm 27. A real, if you want an easy read, you know it's an easier read when it's small and it's paperback. And uh, I'll be reading from that in a few minutes. Uh, another fairly easy read, When Trouble Comes, by Phil Riken. And uh, I think this other book I gave to someone, it's called Always True, by McDonald, who pastors over in the Chicago area. Always True. And then uh, D.A. Carson, How Long, O Lord? A more challenging read. A more challenging read, but very, very good. This was the cry of the Old Testament. How long, O Lord? How long? And then probably my favorite is uh, Timothy Keller's book, I'm Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. And... Um, but we'll come back to a couple of those in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, I want to really begin with just sharing three, just, just to kind of give us a sense of the world that we live in. I want to share three situations that I experienced as a younger pastor. Between the ages of 35 and 40, these three, these three events took place in my ministry. Number one, we had a, uh, a really sweet elderly lady in our church. She was around 80 years old. She came to everything. She came to all the services, and she just had sweet spirit, sweet attitude. One night she was home. She lived alone. She was home and in bed and... An intruder broke in. 
she confronted him. She was tough. She confronted him, and he proceeded to slam her in the head with a brick. She would go into a coma for two years and die. He would be convicted of uh, assault and, uh, and burglary and spend two years in jail. Not long after that, we were coming home from youth camp, and uh, Jeff was, uh, I'm going to say Jeff, Jeff was about the same age as Shannon, he was 14 or 15 years old, and uh, we were coming home from youth camp, we were on the bus, and, uh, and I'm talking to him, and he's telling me, he says, boy, I've had such a great week at camp. I've grown so much spiritually. The Lord just really real to me this week. And I'm just excited about uh, what God's going to do in my life. But he says, but I, I really hate the thought of going home. He lived in a difficult home and a troubled home and a broken home. And, and he said, I just, I just hate to go back. That was on a Friday as we were traveling home. Early the next morning, I received a phone call. When Jeff had got home, he was instructed to spend the night at his uncle's with his, and two smaller, younger uh, nephews. And in the middle of the night, men broke in with shotguns and blew away his uncle and blew Jeff away. The two younger children were in sleeping bags and just stayed quiet. Around this same time, a lady started coming to our church that, uh, uh, that obviously had some, some, uh, uh, some issues in her life and some uh, uh, elements where she really needed help in her life. And she had four, four small girls. Four small girls. The church really rallied around this lady. Whenever we had a church uh, uh, get together and there was food, the ladies would always pack up all the food and send it home with this lady. The oldest girl uh, had reached the age where she could go to junior camp that year. And I, I told the mom, I says, listen, uh, don't worry about any expenses or anything. The church is going to take care of that. We just want you to bring her to go to junior camp. So that morning when we were getting ready to go to camp, the mother brought this little girl. And the little girl had a, uh, just a brown paper bag. And that's what she had, her clothes and everything she would supposedly need for, uh, for the week of camp. The mother dropped her off and left. I proceeded to take that paper bag and throw it in the dumpster. Because I've been in that home and I realized that this paper bag was going to be full of dirty clothes and be full of roaches. One of the ladies in the church had prepared a little suitcase. with all the clothes she would need and toiletries and everything. She went to camp. She had a great time. Not long after that, um, we came to the suspicion that these little girls were being abused. So we called the authorities. An investigation took place. The men who lived in that house were sent to prison. The little girls were sent to foster care. And we would not see the three youngest ever again. But the oldest one, several years later, I was speaking at a retreat, a couple's retreat at a camp. And there was this teenage girl who was on staff. And it was her. And 
she had told me how she had been in a good foster home and she had been uh, adopted by a believing family and how God was working in her life and she was committed to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we could go on. We could talk about natural disasters. We could talk about 300,000 people being killed in a tsunami. We could talk about 9-11. Uh, I remember when 9-11 happened, uh, you know, of course that was morning, but we were in Manila where we lived at that time, and it was, it was night. It was 12 hours difference, it was at night. And I remember getting that phone call that uh, I, I think we were watching TV, but somebody called and said, turn on the news. And there we were, thousands of miles away, watching what was happening in New York City. One of the places that we uh, often ministered in was Cambodia. And I remember the first time we ever went to Cambodia, the believers that we're working with, they said, listen, before you go, you've got to see the killing fields. The killing fields were just not far, uh, uh, a 45 minute ride from the capital city. And in the killing fields, that's where a third of the population of Cambodia was slaughtered. Anybody with uh, any education or any training or any intellect at all was eliminated. And often the government had them killed by their own children. One of the things that I've learned, don't worry, I'll get to the scripture in a minute. One of the things that was fascinating to me in my study on uh, pain and suffering is how cultures around the world, and as a, as a missionary, this really grabbed my attention because how cultures and different religions of the world prepare their people for suffering. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in Hinduism, you have karma. You're going to pay sooner or later for your sin, if not now, in another life. That's what karma is all about. Uh, Buddhism as a, you know, communicates the concept that we have suffering because our desires are out of whack. Uh, our desires are inappropriate. And what we need to do is just not get attached to things. And it won't hurt so bad when we lose them. And I read one author who said that a, a Buddhist prayer might be something like this. It might be kissing your child goodnight and saying I love you and thinking at the same time, but I've got to remember you might be dead tomorrow. Islam is full of fate and that we must endure suffering. But the culture that doesn't handle suffering or handles the suffering in the weakest way is Western secular civilization. Our world. I've got to read something for you here. I even remember the page without my notes. Just uh, recently, um, uh, Richard Dawkins, the world-renowned physicist, passed away. And uh, in his book, River Out of Eden, A Darwinian View of Life, and, uh, and many in Western civilization have a Darwinian view of life. This is what he wrote. He says, the total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. He goes on to make fun of Christians and that we have purpose on the brain. Because in Christianity there is uh, 
meaning. There is purpose to our suffering. Oh, we have uh, different kinds of suffering. We have suffering because of the bad things that we do. And David's a good example of that. David and Bathsheba and killing her husband. Uh, these are, uh, David would go on to suffer greatly. His family would go on to suffer greatly because of something that he had done. But be very careful. Don't get the mindset that everything bad happens to us because of something we've done. Okay? Don't go there. Sometimes bad things happen to us because of the good things that we do. And Paul's a wonderful example of that. Paul was told at the very beginning at his conversion that he would suffer many things for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you read through, through 2 Corinthians, you'll just be reminded that Paul went through suffering after suffering after suffering because he was communicating the wonderful message of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of suffering can be classified as just universal. We live in a fallen world, and because of that, people die, people get sick. We live in a world that was made good, but sin came, and therefore, death. Therefore, suffering. And then finally, if to, to make up any good multiple choice uh, question, uh, uh, sin can be, be, I mean, suffering can come because of the bad things we do, because of the good things we do, because it's just we live in a fallen, broken world, or fourthly, uh, none of the above. <laughs> None of the above. And that's where our good friend Job comes into the picture. And um, Job uh, suffered greatly. Job lost his, um, his possessions. He lost his family. He lost his health. And, uh, and he never knows why. And I'm convinced we'll probably never know why many of the sufferings that we go through. But the key message to Job is that we need to trust God even when we don't know why. Amen. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. Let me just begin in verse 1. Isaiah 43, But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. One of the main metaphors in the Bible, figures of speech that describe going through affliction, going through difficulty, uh, is, is walking through it. Is walking through it. Uh, Psalm 23, we, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, Psalm 69 speaks about uh, uh, walking through deep waters. And then I believe it's Psalm 72 that speaks of walking in the slippery places. Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, you notice he doesn't say if you pass through the waters. It's when. Oh, the best thing, though, is God says, I will be with you. And that's become my theme over these last several years, and, uh, and my children, they picked that up from me. The Lord is with us. Amen. The Lord is with us. When you pass through the waters, 
I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And then down in verse 5, fear not, for I am with you. Probably the uh, best biblical example of walking through the fire is our three Hebrew friends in Daniel chapter 3. We have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have been taken from their homeland and trained to be civil servants. And, uh, and then one day the king, Nebuchadnezzar, builds this large statue, 90 feet tall. It's either a statue of him or a statue of his kingdom or a combination thereof. And Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, when the band plays, I want all of my civil servants, all of my officials to hit the ground and worship the image that I have set up. The music plays, and he says, and if you don't, you're going in the fiery furnace. The music plays, everybody hits the ground and worships the image except for our three friends. Nebuchadnezzar gets the report about them. They're brought to him. He is enraged. Uh, he seems to want to give them a second chance, and, and they're going, hey, king, king, it's okay. You really don't have to give us a second chance because we're not going to bow down to the image. Our God is a powerful God and he can deliver us. But if he doesn't, that's okay. Either through the fire or through our death, he is going to be with us. They are taken and thrown into the fire. The fire is so hot, the men that throw them in die of the great heat. The king gets down and he looks inside the furnace and, uh, and he says, hey, didn't we just throw three guys in there? And everybody goes, yeah, king, yeah, three. He says, well, now I see four. And the fourth one is like a, like a son of God. And we could talk at great length about this, but, uh, uh, but I, I personally, I believe it was the angel of the Lord, and, and I believe the angel of the Lord was God. I believe it was Jesus. I believe Jesus was walking in the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. And they were not harmed. Listen, folks, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be harmed, that we're not going to have uh, uh, severe difficulties. But it means our souls are going to be protected. It means that we're not going to be left in despair. In your notes there, I left room for a little bit of... Uh, no taking on your behalf. And uh, I just got three things I want to share with you. Just three practical things. Um, they're real deep. Real deep. You notice there's a little, you know, not much space to write on there. But, um, but just three key lessons that I just want to leave with you this morning. Number one. We need to learn to trust in the Lord. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I really believe they just trusted God. They didn't trust God and their plan. They didn't trust God and how they think it ought to turn out and what God ought to do. Uh, a lot of times when we're hurting, we go to God and we tell him basically what he ought to be doing. God, I know you're God, and I know you're in charge, and I know you know what's best, but on this you need to listen to me. We need to learn to trust him. Our God is a uh, sovereign God. He rules. 
He's in charge. Things don't happen to you and me by accident. Richard Dawkins is not correct. Our God has everything under control. Our God is all powerful. Our God is all knowing and he's good. Sometimes people, they, they go through suffering and they say, God, if you were really all powerful, you'd do something about this. Or if you were really good, you'd take care of this. God is doing exactly what we would do if we knew everything that he knew. We need to trust in the Lord. And let me tell you what. Don't wait until you get to that difficult time to start trusting him. It may be too late. Start trusting him now. Start depending upon him now. Start looking to him now. Don't wait for the difficulty to come. You know what? The scripture is very clear that our suffering burns out the impurities and can make us stronger. Remember, you realize I, I said can make us stronger or it might destroy us. It depends on how we respond. Are you going to trust him? The second thought I have for you is uh, another little word. <laughs> it's, in, it's wait on the Lord. Psalm 27, uh, 14. Psalm 27, 14. By the way, about 10 years ago, I was asked to come and uh, teach at the seminary in, Hancock, in, in, in Hong Kong. And, um, and I said, well, what, we were going to be there for two weeks. And I, and I said, well, what do you want me to teach? And they said, well, we want you to teach the book of Psalms. And I thought to myself, I've never done that. In fact, I had not spent a, a great deal of time in the Psalms. But 10 years ago, the Lord gave me the Psalms because he knew I was going to need it. And it's one of the things that's fascinating about the book of Psalms. The older we get, the better we like it. The more we need it, the more we see what's there for us. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Then Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I, I encourage you to wait on the Lord. He's worth waiting for. And now, I'm not a big poetry guy, but uh, in Paul David Tripp's little book here on Psalm 27, A Shelter in the Time of Storm, uh, he has uh, a poem here, and, uh, and I like his poetry. It's just fun to read. The title is, Why I Hate to Wait. I could have written this. I hate to wait. I have places to go. I have people to see. I have things to do. I love me. And I have a wonderful plan for my life. I hate to wait. 
I don't like obstacles in my way or people that disagree or processes that take too long. I hate to wait. I don't like lines or traffic or delayed appointments or tardy people. I hate to wait. I wake up every day with an agenda. I know what, what I want to accomplish. I know how I want it done. I know where I want it done. I know when I want it done. I know who I want to do it. I know why it has to be done this way. I hate to wait because I'm the one having to wait. I don't mind that you have to wait, <laughs> but I don't want to have to wait with you. I hate to wait because I tend to put myself in the one place I am never supposed to be and I tend to want to be the one thing I should never crave to be. I hate to wait because I want to be in the center of my universe and I want to be my own sovereign. When I forget your plan, when I lose sight of your will, when I begin to think that my life belongs to me, when I fall prey to the delusion that I'm wiser than you and my way is better than yours, then I hate to wait and I curse the obstacles in my way. But you are sovereign, and you are good, and loving, and gracious, and kind, and mighty, filled with compassion, overflowing with mercy. You bought me with the price of your son. You forgave me, and the cost was his death. For all my attempts at independent wisdom and self-sovereignty, the truth is that my life does not belong to me. So once more, I fall to my knees. Once more, I open my hands, and I give my life back to you. And say, you do in, with, and through me what you think is best, and I will follow. And when your wisdom and grace require it, I will be willing to wait. We must trust in the Lord. We must wait on the Lord. And then the third thing, we must hope in the Lord. One of the greatest things about Christianity is that our hope is in the Lord. Amen. You know one of the things I'm excited about? I'm going to get a new body. Hey, this, this one's starting to break down. Linda and I turned 70 this year. But I'm going to get a new body. Linda's going to get a new body, going to get a new brain. Not only that, Revelation 21 tells us that um, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and no more tears and no more pain. No more suffering. It's all going to be good. I get weary when people talk about heaven sounds like it's going to be boring. I said, man, get, out of, get away from me. John um, chapter 16, verse 33 I'm sure I'd read this many times over the years, but just recently it's become very real, real. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is just, just not long before he's going to be arrested and tried and crucified. John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, be encouraged. I have overcome the world. Our Savior has overcome the world. Amen. And we're going to have tribulation and we're going to have difficulties. We're going to have trials. But our Savior says, be encouraged. I have overcome the world. Last thought that I have for you. In our culture today, uh, we've come up with this concept of people having fight songs that help them with their difficulties. 
Uh, for example, uh, people with can the Cancer Association has officially named the song that we hear a lot in commercials and it's on all over the internet, has been for some time, but it's the, the, you know, the, 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 the tune, you know, this is my fight song, and this is my life song, and uh, this is a song that prove, this is a prove that I'm all right song. And, uh, and if you would uh, Google, like for example, cancer fight songs, uh, you get a whole list of them. Well, most of them I haven't even heard of, haven't even heard of them, but, uh, 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 but there ain't no mountain high enough. And, uh, but just a whole list of cancer fight songs. So one day I got to thinking, I think, I thought, well, maybe Linda and I need a fight song. And uh, so I started putting some thought into that. And, and I decided that I was going to pick a fight song for Linda and I was going to pick a fight song for me. And, uh, and I went through the hymnal, went through a lot of the hymns, and I started thinking about uh, uh, some of the newer songs that we have sung uh, in church and, uh, and how, what a blessing they've been to me. In fact, if I were to pick one of the new songs uh, that we sing in church to be a, a fight song, uh, the song that we sang this morning, He Will Hold Me Fast. Amen. I'm always fascinated by that, uh, uh, the use of the word fast. It's like, hold me fast. And um, the, the, the concept is communicated in, uh, I believe it's Isaiah 57. My daughter made me a plaque with this on it. Um, But I'm not finding it. Anyways, Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 57, and it speaks of the, of, of the Lord holding us. He will keep me fast or steadfast. And, uh, and it's like he, he keeps me real quick, or he doesn't wait around to keep me or to hold me, but he will hold me fast. But I decided to go back in time for Linda and I and pick our fight songs from songs that we knew years and years ago. Uh, some of you might not know, but Linda and I, 70 years ago, were in the same nursery, the same church nursery. And uh, when Linda was around 14, 15, she sang in a trio. Uh, Linda and Sandy and Wendy, and it's that Wendy that we would name our Wendy after. And that Wendy, even as a teenager, suffered greatly from arthritis and would, would have multiple, multiple surgeries until the Lord took her home. But they sang in youth group, they sang in church, and... Uh, and they sang a lot of different songs, but they had a signature song. And that's the song that I chose for Linda's fight song. And the title of it is Jesus and Me. Now there's another Jesus and Me song out there that's like a country western kind of a song. It's not that one. This one goes back to 1946, and it's, it's a bluegrass song is what it is. And it's, uh, the chorus goes like this. And now it's Jesus and me for each tomorrow. For every heartache and every sorrow. I know that I could depend upon my newfound friend. And so, until the end, it's Jesus and me. For my fight song, I went back to where we were about seven years old, and we were in primary Sunday school class together, and we were learning all those songs that probably are not sung anymore, 
but there was a song that's always stayed with me. In fact, uh, on, on a given day when I visit Linda, I have a little routine, you know, I feed her, I try to feed her uh, some food, I, uh, I read to her, we pray together, and I take her for a walk. She's in a special chair and I can walk her around the building, and as we walk, I usually sing to her. And I, I, I just imagine her thinking, Lord, why didn't you give this guy a better voice? Why do I have to listen to this? But we walk around the building and I, and I, uh, I like to sing hymns and anything I can remember. But I like to go back and remember the songs that we sang as kids. Mike, you'll remember this one. This is my fight song. Just a simple chorus, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Strength for today is mine all the way and all that I need for tomorrow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. I want to encourage you to trust him. I want you to learn to wait on him. And I want you to put your hope in him. And in all of this, don't forget the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that Jesus went to the cross and suffered and died that we might have forgiveness, that we might have life. It was the sufferings of Jesus that paid it all. Tim, would you come? Would you come and just dismiss this in a word of prayer? Would you stand with me as we close in prayer this morning? Father, I'm reminded that your word tells us sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And as Jesus said elsewhere, yes, in this world you will have trouble. But I thank you too that your word tells us my grace is sufficient for you. And we bow before you today and say it's true. It's always true. Thank you for the grace that you give us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.